in the Shire Lions. I'm um, the Brisbane chapter lead for Street Level Australia. Um, we've got um, Millie, uh, whose uh, Zoom name is Street Level on there. She's our um, founder and uh, Perth chapter lead. Um, and uh, we've got the immense privilege of hearing from Dr. Neil Boris, um, who is um, an architect, an urbanist, uh, and founder of the Classic Planning Institute, um, uh, also which runs the Classic Planning Academy, uh, which I'm doing this year. Um, and, uh, very, very happy to be doing. Um, I'm sure most of you have uh, either heard of or seen Dr. Boris's work, um, but uh, a, a lot of the Classic Planning Institute's work helps communities with their long-term planning, um, helps architects who are inventing new local styles, um, running the Classic Planning Academy, uh, and also just what we were talking about before, if you were here a couple of minutes ago, researching the neuroscience um, of the built environment um, with, uh, with a number of uh, his colleagues. Um, so we're very, we're very happy to have you, Dr. Boris. And um, just before we continue, um, I'll just say that um, we're going to have several points for questions. Um, so if you want to put any questions or thoughts or comments in the chat window, I'll, um, I'll read them out at, at question time. Uh, over to you, Dr. Boris. Well, thank you very, very much. I'm truly honored to be here. Um, I have been uh, supported and the Classic Planning Institute has been supported by Millie Main and Street Level on uh, unsurpassed levels. And the heroism, the student heroism of Ms. Lyons is legend because our classes are very early in the morning, Australia time, middle of the night. And I don't know how she does it, but she's doing a great job and we're so proud to uh, be uh, connected. And, and, and we have quite a few people who are our friends in Australia. So thank you for being here. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Paris and um, basically, this city is about as dense as you can get and still have a really beautiful environment. You can maybe add a floor, that's about it. But even a floor is like 15%. So that's a lot of additional population. <clears throat> and the wonderful thing about it obviously is the beauty. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, about the sort of the fundamentals and the background and how we got there. And we touched on it just a few minutes ago while we were waiting to start. So in the chat window, you're going to find a um, you're going to find a um, I hope that it's still there um, a um, PDF and that PDF is of a um, is of a an Doric order and the idea is for you to I'm putting it again in the in the in the chat window in case somebody didn't see it or however Zoom works the idea is pretty sounds a little dumb however uh, what's going to happen is that your brain is going to be really really happy. And it's going to start secreting dopamine because with technical jargon, um, and, and we're not going to get much into it, but the way it works is that there are multiple statistical fractals in these shapes, and they imitate the experience of nature. So art, the experience of art imitates the experience of nature. Very different from what we have today, these strange things, which tell us that all this kind of architecture was supposed to be forward facing, was supposed to be like the architecture of the future, but we're already very deep in the future. And we're gonna have more future. Um, the climate change pandemics, challenges to democracy and war that are already going full steam ahead are going to be joined by 30 other 
various and sundry epidemics and <laughs> disasters. Um, and I'm not going to go into the doom and gloom part of it. As a matter of fact, although we're aware of the doom and gloom, our position is a non-dystopian future. So we're uh, looking at the mistakes, the errors that were made in the 20th and 21st century, stuff like forgetting the human, blind belief in technology. Check this one out. This is the idea that, 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 that strangeness indicates progress because you've never seen it before. So this is a brand new project from Amsterdam. It looks like a piece of, uh, of, uh, of Ukraine. The, the actual, this is beyond bad taste. This is really disgusting, basically, that people would build stuff like this just to be different. And then, of course, you have this lovely phenomenon of annihilating beauty. And I wish I knew what they were saying. It sounded fun. Um, and this whole business of our experiences are getting, the spectrums are narrowing and narrowing. You have today in film, blues and blacks, and occasional odd, very striking colors that don't seem real. And other movies look like they've been hand colored. Whereas if you look at, at a C movie from 1982, it's gonna look beautiful because it's analog. Same thing happening in music, we're losing spectrum. And I'm wondering if we're not losing spectrum in food as well. The, 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 the big deal with regard to the, the disciplines that we work in is that I'm not gonna tell you anything you don't know. You know all this stuff or you have an intuition with regard to it. Um, but we have the tools and the explanation and we help people wield these things so that we can have a non-techy, non-dystopian, not weird, not strange, not feral future. And to me, that's really, really important for all of our grandchildren and great-grandchildren. So what we're offering the world is classic planning, which is how we build cities before planning ruined them. And we ask the question why we love some places uh, or feel nothing with uh, regard to others? And the answer is either we love these cities because of their um, of their uh, geographical beauty, their natural beauty, or because of their architectural beauty. And this is where the experience of art imitates the experience of nature. We'll get back to that one. We'll say, we'll hear it at least twice or three times. Um, and we know that if we understand what's going on, then we can ask for what we need and deserve as humans, because the whole idea of cities is to create contact among people for their synergies. So all the stuff that you see in here, by the way, this was medieval architecture and people tend to want to think that it was somehow done miraculously by itself, by the community. The building code of this town, Siena in Italy, was an inch thick in 1250. Everything was prescribed. The sizes of the windows around, look at the windows, they're all kind of the same going around the, the campo. And this was originally the market, the market meadow actually, and then eventually it got built around. The fundamental of what we do is best condensed in three words, firmness, commodity, delight. That is durability, adaptive reuse, and aesthetic experience. And this actually is the translation into the terms of the built environment of the idea, this Greek philosophical idea of the unity of truth, goodness, and beauty. And the idea that this unity actually defines holism. You change one, you're changing it all. You're, you're measuring one, you're measuring them all. And actually describes the universe. That's too highfalutin. 
So let's come back down to simple stuff. We need a language to communicate with regard to the built environment. And when you're standing in the middle of a street, what you see most of is buildings. So obviously they're very, very important. So if we understand architectural literacy, if we're architecturally literate, we can have a real conversation with regard to what's going on. And that actually empowers, it, it empowers us to, to participate in planning and architecture stuff in town, understanding what it is and not being befuddled by the jargon of experts. So the idea of, of this architectural literacy is that you can look at something as complicated as this, as this and Ms. Lyons today, I guarantee, actually knows what she's looking at um, because she is today literate, architecturally literate, but she wasn't architecturally literate last year. And if she looked at this last year, she wouldn't have known where to start to, to read this, but we read this like musical notes. If you know musical notation, you can hear the melody. If you are architecturally literate, you know what's going on and you can make the next one. You don't have to be an expert. It, it, the expert there, is, there are requirements for expertise, but the fundamentals are that any person can be an architect. And George, uh, George Washington was an architect. Um, uh, Thomas Jefferson was an architect. It was part of normal life among ladies and gentlemen to know architecture. The concepts that underpin all this stuff are really, really simple. You'll, you'll start thinking of, of fairy tales, of, of uh, whatever, children's stories. Everything has three parts, front, middle, back, top, middle, bottom. But the point is that they're not three equal, equally sized parts. They are parts that come with content and they're relative to each other. That's part of that holistic thing. Everything comes in three sizes. Small, medium, and large. So there are only three types of buildings in the world, small, medium, and large. And, and, and the way they're distinguished by their uses is not really true because we know that you can put apartments in a, in a former hotel building and you can make offices out of former apartments. So that's not how it works. This use thing is a little bit of a red herring. And here's something that you guys will like. There are only three ways to connect rooms. I mean, you'd think that there's an infinite number. Nah, sorry, three ways. And yet with these limited and limiting elements, we get stuff that looks like this. Fantastically rich, really pretty. And it's playing all the possible, it's pushing all your possible neuroesthetic um, perceptual buttons all at once, giving you a really nice feeling. So the way it works, the whole thing works is got the brain thing going on. We have the place thing going on because no two places are the same. And then we have the urban design element. Yeah, Trinity is wired in us. Yeah, it's a nice way of saying it. Um, it, it goes deeper even than we generally think. I agree. Then you have the urban design, which we tell the story with. We create the experience. We, we create the sequence of experiences urbanly. So the neuroscience of the classical method actually comes from understanding proportions. And I invite you to read this in the Art of Classic Planning, where it explains these things a little more in detail. But fundamentally, who here has heard of the golden proportion, the golden section? Everybody, I assume, almost everybody. The point is <clears throat> that that's one of seven proportions that operate simultaneously on everything all the time. So three of them are essential. Trinity, somebody said, three of them are essential. One is symmetry, that's equality. One is little big. And one is punctuation, the tip of the leaf, tip of the nose, last joint of the finger, 
And you see in these magenta and, and, and uh, cyan uh, diagrams that you have these proportions reappearing self-similar at different scales. That makes these arrangements a statistical fractal or statistical fractals. And there are seven of them that we identify. With the, the seventh one, we kind of leave it open because we assume it is, but we don't know what it is. And the way it works is that when your brain encounters these sets of three lines, you, you see that every one of these shapes is, is connected is, is at the edges of the intersections of it or the ends of it. You have sets of three lines. They appear in these proportions. It lights up the beauty center in, the, in your brain behind where your third eye is supposed to be, coincidentally. And, and it just works because the multiple fractals of nature with the clouds, the rocks, the trees, the water, the, the grass, the everything, every single one of them is a different fractal. A tree has three fractals to begin with. The fractal of the leaves, of the bark, and of the limbs. And that's what makes a tree beautiful. A cactus has maybe two fractals, the limbs and the and the patterns of the spines, the ribs, okay? The bujum tree has no fractals. It's, it's got really no fractals. If you've ever seen a bujum tree, you wanna take a look at it, it's very funny. But the experience of art equals, is similar to the experience of nature. And you see the multifractality of, of, of this uh, classical design in, in, in Delhi. And we test this using um, um, eye tracking. And you can see that in the modern design in the lower left, the most important parts are the screens, which supposedly tell the story of this memorial to Eisenhower, President Eisenhower. But when you look at the eye tracking, the eye is going everywhere all the time. There's absolutely no, no order to it. And actually, the eyes land at places that are immaterial to the actual design. Whereas in, in a traditional design, the eyes go bang, smack to the place where you have all of your, all of your sculpture and, and all of your, all of your uh, lettering, all of the, all of the text on a, on a monument. How did that happen? Well, that's how it works. Magic a place. No two places on earth are the same. So the, the picture on the left is in Paris. And the picture on the right is um, Tucson, Arizona. And if they took all of the traditional buildings in Tucson, Arizona, it would be the most beautiful desert city ever. But um, nobody did that. The important thing about memory is that it's locational. It's not chronological. So that you remember everything based on where you did it. And that validates intergenerational connections where you're, you're going to tell your kids, I was there and there's no there there. They're not going to believe you. At least it, 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 the, the, your validity drops. You, be, you become a myth. The places become mythical. And it helps create the architecture of place the, which would be authentic and naturally durable. The third, third thing that we have going is the holistic tools for urbanism. And we're looking at assemblies, if you will, but God forbid industrialized assemblies, assemblies of shapes, assemblies of, of, of materials uh, wrought in different ways by human hands so that we have the public space, we have canals, we have classic streets, arcaded streets, courtyards, parks, atriums, avenues, boulevards, each one of these, these are the elements of composition. And, and you immediately see how you can juxtapose them in such a manner that you're getting a, a narrative, an urban narrative. And you form them, you give them shapes based on the community that you're in. The interesting thing here is then as a place matures, <clears throat> there's an opportunity to make it prettier. And that's how a place matures. It starts rather simple, 
like the Rialto Bridge was a wood drawbridge. The shape of the bridge actually recalls exactly that wood drawbridge. And the guy who, who won the competition, I forget his name, something, De Ponte, bridge man, um, he, he, he copied the diagram of the original wooden drawbridge that was there. Palladio put a, a proposal for here. It was a three arch thing. It, nah, didn't fly. Um, this, this did. And it also uses a type of a bridge, which is a, the most traditional Roman bridge. Paris, again, is one of the best examples for how to build a city because we get to really fantastic densities in really pretty, in a really, really pretty way. So the density of Paris is similar to the density of New York. If you took all of New York and laid it flat, all the tall buildings, you get a five, six story city, which is what Paris is. And of course, the boulevards, the avenues, I think you're starting to get the idea of how we, have you heard me mention vehicles yet? They're ephemeral. We're really looking at the permanent stuff and let the ephemeral stuff live course through the veins, if you will, but this is a this is definitely a, a metaphor and not arterial streets and such. No, thank you. You have small, medium, and large streets. Everything comes in three sizes. And we don't believe in modes of traffic. We believe in people. You have people in cars, people in, in, in metros, people in buses, people driving Ferraris. You got all sorts of people floating around in the street and they negotiate in the street individually, one with the other. When you're crossing a street and somebody stops for you, you automatically go to their eyes. You wanna see what they're looking at. You wanna know that they're looking at you. It's built in and we need to come back to intuitive street design. Things that are important are more pretty than other things that are less important. Things that are important should be the big ones, which kind of removes tall buildings from the conversation altogether. They're, some kind, of a, they're kind of a weird aberration. They're a, they're a medieval trope. Countryside, super important. Town and country. The balance of town and country is what actually makes urbanism. You don't have town without country. You don't have country without town. And countryside is a... The remarkable thing about countryside is that it can absorb stuff that the city simply can't. Oh, you had Andrew Cameron. That's great. Yeah, he was great. Yeah, he's like, currently he's the man. So um, the final thing I wanna throw out at you here is this hand-eye thing that we were talking about earlier. Um, this started with, <clears throat> when I was writing uh, the book that I wrote, um, I wrote about half of it in six months, and then it took me a whole year to do transport, and a whole year to do sprawl, and a whole year to do craftsmanship, to just understand what's going on? And craftsmanship is a really weird one because we love the craft and, we, and we, dis, uh, we disrespect the craftsman. So what is actually going on? Um, at, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a nexus of things very, very in, uh, potent and uniquely human, w whether they're evolutionary adaptations or they are, or, or, or they're neurological wiring or who knows what it is. Um, but I, I am convinced that planetary construction is the key, sorry, is that manual construction is the key to, to a lot of well-being, at least today, until we are done building those, those beautiful structures. And we certainly need to get rid of these things because all they represent is individuals who one way or another received government special privileges from governments and nothing else. 
indeed, um, you, you can see that the skyline actually represents the city for London. It's the poster child for bad, bad skyline. You have Florence over there. Um, the, 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 sky, the skyline of New York, I think, is unique. And I think that New York should stay unique. It's not a model for anything. But it is fun, you know, standing on the 30th floor and looking at all this stuff. You just don't need it everywhere. It's good to have somewhere, but you don't need it everywhere. And yeah, I forgot, plant lots of trees. Three most important things in urbanism are plant lots of trees, plant lots of trees, and plant lots of trees. Any questions so far? Don't think anyone's put anything in the chat yet. Um, please feel free to to do so if you have any questions. Or... Five, four, three, two, one. Oh, thank you, Nicola. I'll I'll share with you a project. The project that actually kicked off classic planning. Um, we were a bunch of architects, traditional architects, classical architects sitting around a table looking at the map of Washington DC and there's a river that goes through the city. Um, it's this thing over here, it's called the Anacostia River. And um, we looked at it and said, oh my God, that is a wasteland. It's, it's a it's a muddy river, very shallow. It it uh, it constantly um, constantly floods, and the floods are like twelve feet. It's a four four foot deep uh, river with a flood flooding periodical flooding at twelve feet because it's part of an estuary system. Um, and and it has freeways alongside. It's a mess, <clears throat> but we looked at what. So we said, okay, we we we'll work on this. We're, um, we are gonna work on this river. And so you go back to the origins of DC, which were the L'Enfant plan. It's a really smart plan, unique in the world. And it was the largest urban plan of its sort made for a long time. And then they had a second, a second round a hundred years after because the plan started being abused. You can see here, you see this building over here. This is the US Capitol. This is the, the Library of Congress. And there's the street that runs here along the diagonal and that is Pennsylvania Avenue. And you can see that this building actually, it, 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 it sits right on Pennsylvania Avenue. And that this building here also blocks the view of the president's house from the, the White House from the Capitol. So these a bunch of people in 1902, 1903, the Senate Parks Commission, and we and there were three, four of the greatest architects of the time in the, in the United States worked on this plan, which organized and invented DC. So it got a second, a second round of good stuff. The first round was French. These guys were all French educated. So there was a continuity in terms of the of the um sort of the spirit, the culture behind what was going on. And then in the 50s, you got this kind of stuff going. The bridge might be okay somehow or other, but the, 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 this is cancer. I mean, it's really weird. Um, and the city started losing its, losing its um, character when in fact, that river could look something like this. And of course, it was natural for us to say, ah, let's build the Anacostia River like the Seine. So this is the river. It has underused parks alongside it, freeways, all this is freeways. Um, and this is um, uh, yet more freeways. And this one dies here because it was supposed to connect here, but they never built the bridge kind of a thing. There are there are in every American city, but especially in DC, you have these little stubs. 
the freeway people have not given up. They keep on building bits of ramps and bits of bridges and bits of, of embankments because they have budgets for them, but they're not connected. So you go to places and you just see, you know, the, the freeway thing hanging out in, you know, in, in thin air, the, the deck and so on. This is five miles from top of the picture to the mouth of the river. And it has, it has a, a, a bridge every mile, which makes the whole place completely not walkable. Worse, they're all freeway bridges. So you really don't want to walk on them. They might have a sidewalk, three foot sidewalk on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a freeway. So what we did was we got rid of all the bad stuff. Look at all this real estate. Then we narrowed the river to the width of the Seine. And we created an island over here, like Ile de la Cité, but this is United States. For real estate purposes, we actually added 20% or 15% to the riverfront real estate. So you're upping the, upping the ante for this kind of development. It's good for developers. Classic planning is very good for developers. It's good for the community and it's good for developers because you can get away with almost anything in terms of density. And then we threw the bridges across it, connected them, and you have all this, all this green stuff. We had 28 new keys, 19 new bridges, 17 new squares. And instead of freeways, these are the freeways, we got boulevards. So it's starting to make sense from an urban standpoint. Of course, learning from the river, Um, um, learning from the river, the, the number one thing was the hydrogeology and the comparing the, the, the rivers. Um, you'll cross the Seine twice a day easily, back and forth. The Thames a little less so. You probably might, but they'll probably, the second time you'll want to drive it. And the, the Seine model is a really, really smart model. Actually, back in 1903, when they did the that Macmillan plan, they also called out these river edges to be treated like the Seine in Paris. So it wasn't our idea. We just actually drew what the Senate Park Commission had written, had suggested. And the, the big idea in terms of the riverfront in, in Paris is that it's a two-tiered riverfront. And it's got the lower key where goods used to be brought in from the barges under the, under the um, promenades into the buildings. And, um, and then no more barges because all the goods now come by train and truck. So what happened was that they got converted to um, freeways and train, train tracks and all kinds of uh, utilitarian and, and, and and transportation kind of uses. But the lesson to learn is if you build it right, you can reuse it. And everything built before World War II pretty much is reusable one way or another. Everything built after World War II is not. Well, for one, it's not built very well, but in addition to that, it, the, the, the functional fit is dysfunctional once the function has evaporated and the function evaporates mighty fast. Look at hospitals, look at airports. Have you ever encountered one of these that is not dysfunctional before opening day? And all these uh, new urban features, most significant of which is a huge park system just north of, of the river. And that's where the flooding can be absorbed because you have a, an, a, an aquatic park, you have an arboretum and you have a golf course. And that's exactly the model they have in Paris. So there is a place north, it's in the countryside and it gets flooded and then it's just fine. Paris has flooded only twice in the last 110 years. So obviously you're getting the sustainability and the original green, you're getting the community benefits, you're getting the tiered access to opportunity. All that stuff is built in with the system because you're doing it holistically. 
truth, goodness, and beauty at in operation fundamentally is what's going on here. So we're here to talk a little bit about building like Hausman built Paris. And there were places, there were grand places that pre preceded everything that happened in Paris, like uh, uh, St. Peter's Plaza in, in Rome. Um, there were these fantastic chateaux and, and gardens. This is um, 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 Vaux de Vicon, um, which Louis XIV uh, took from um, his uh, finance minister. Fouquet, poor guy. Uh, this is the, the view in the other direction or in the same direction. It's really pretty. And, and actually the house is not that big. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's actually a residential size, very big for a residential house, but the, it's not huge. And then you have Versailles, of course, with the view in the other direction. Um, that's they, these were large, these were large uh, interventions that were urban scale that people knew about. So when a series, uh, af actually Napoleon started working on organizing Paris and he had some streets that he wanted extended, connected, intersected and so on. But there were these neighborhoods where you had typhoid. Um, and they they just had too many um, typhoid epidemics, and the places really needed to be rebuilt for for health purposes. Um, there were some canals in there thrown in. This is medieval Paris. What it looked like, uh, what it looked like in eighteen twenty thirty, and this is part of what. Um, good old houseman built. Um, this is uh, Rue de Rivoli, um, where you see here, these, these buildings are giving you an arcade along the street so you can walk in comfort. It has the main living floor on the second level. And that's the reason that it has the terrace here. Then it has the third level, which is the bedrooms, the level above that, which is for children and, and servants and the top level the garret is for starving artists and for drying the uh, drying laundry so uh, this uh this model and you actually have above the, the laundry drying is above the garret in in the roof space so this is a very very clever high density way of building and they all have interior courtyards or their sort of prong shaped or such. And they look pretty good. I think that they it's, it's really cleaned up because all of these now I believe are government buildings or, or offices or something. You can feel they're not lived in, whatever. But here's a map that kind of shows some of the interventions he was making. Um, and I'm not even sure what's what, other than knowing that the I I really don't know what's what. I'm I'm not sure how to read this map. I never really paid that much attention to it. But this this whole area here is the um, the Louvre complex, and so on. So this would be the Rue de Rivoli, and you see here connections that were made for basically infrastructural reasons and also as a way of slashing through a neighborhood in such a way that you could clean it up easily. And he built a huge amount of, of buildings. This is the opera, fountains, small drinking fountains, and, and notice the, the, the thing for dogs also down at the bottom, kiosks, markets extensive extensive markets and this business of the stone the the brick and look at the diaper pattern on the brick and then the cast iron uh, holding up the glazing on top is a model that was carried through all of the french possessions around the world 
you find exactly this wall section in Cambodia and in Dakar and in, and in Haiti, everywhere. And here you see, this is a typical Haussmannian building and you can see that they have courtyards in there for light, for air and privacy. And this is Rue Haussmann itself um, named for him. And this is the last street finished in 1910. He started in 1854. It was his work was stopped in 1870 by the Franco-Prussian War. Um, it included train station, Gare de l'Est, Gare du Nord. Um, the, these are these statues represent the cities that are served by the Gare du Nord, by the trains leaving from the Gare du Nord, and parks, huge, huge parks, four large parks, among them by the Boulogne, which was the conversion of a hunting park into a, a city park, Parc Monceau, a, a private aristocratic or royal park, um, also in the middle of town. This was a, a quarry. This is the, um, um, the, the park that is just north of Montmartre, on the other side of Montmartre. When you can already see these ridiculous buildings, it looks like Tel Aviv. But anyways, this is the Butte Chaumont Park. You can see water down here going through it. It's really amazing. And then the the the, the waterfronts, which actually predate they predate uh, they they're from the 1700s. Perhaps most important was um, the water system. He put in the water towers and the sewers. At a total cost of one trillion dollars in today's money, also also lots of uh, gas illumination, making Paris the city of light. So I need to hear a slide that says "City of Light." Questions? Are you still into this? We do have, we do have uh, uh, one question in the chat uh, from Anthony uh, Spagnolo. How important are good public buildings? in setting the tone for the rest of the place. Anybody want to answer that? I think you can see it in, in the Paris of the photos you were showing, like you want those. The, the public um, buildings are the important community buildings, certainly not the commercial buildings. I would say that not just the public buildings, but the way that they're composed and oriented. If you compare Paris to say the unrelenting grid in Manhattan, Manhattan, you know, you have maybe Grand Central Station and a few moments in, where the grid intersects downtown, but what you don't get, which you do get in Paris, is this grand termination of vistas where you might not even be going to the opera, but you're constantly forced to face these terminations and circle them and interact with them, even if you're just transmitting yourself through the public realm. That, that, that's very true. Thank you. Um, the business of terminating vistas actually comes from landscape design. L'Enfant actually franked all of the avenues in Washington, D.C. so that he would have terminated vistas. But he got into trouble and he took the plans and left. So they had to reconstitute them from memory. And at that point, they straightened all of the avenues out, except for one kink in Massachusetts Avenue. It's the only kink left in the in the DC map. I personally I'm not sure about that theory so much. Um, because you really can't see that far down a street. What you, you're not going to see a mile. You see a few hundred yards and then the brain automatically sort of puts an end to the, the, each block is a different room, so to speak. So the way I see streets is that they are a sequence of rooms rather than something long that has a terminating vista. I don't think that's what happens in streets. I think the terminated vista happens in, in the landscape and the terminated vista is where you have your, 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 your cross axes happening. So I think this is worth exploring. Um, but the idea of the terminated vista caused Camilo Sete 
to write about enclosure of, of plazas as if you have to enclose the plaza on all sides. But actually the, the brain completes the enclosure. You can have a plaza that's open to a river and the river edge is gonna be, it's gonna, it's gonna enclose that, that's gonna be the edge because the brains seek edges. So the brains are more interested in the edges than in what happens at the end of the, so I think we a little more neuroscience, but the basic science is sorely lacking. But that was a really good comment. Thank you. Do you have more content, Dr. Burritz? Because I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Do you have, have more content have more though? Content. You do, okay. Yeah, well, more. you keep going with that and I'll ask it at the end. Oh, okay. So what this kind of Grand Avenue stuff, um, you, you see it in DC. Uh, this is from the um, from the top of the dome of the U.S. Capitol. Um, this is a fantastic avenue um, boulevard, technically a boulevard, um, uh, Franklin Boulevard that um, connects City Hall in Philadelphia, and and the view is taken from the City Hall Tower and the um, Philadelphia Museum of Art at the far end. This is a view from the museum back at the City Hall Tower. Say it again, Mike. And this is um, an avenue in Mexico City, La Reforma, taken from Chapultepec. Um, from Chapultepec um, Palace. Um, it, it's the, the home of Maximilian. A unique building, by the way. Uh, it's all about outdoor living. All the rooms open to the outdoors and the interior space. It, they're all sort of U-shaped facing out, all the rooms. And then the inside stuff is just the corridors connecting them and going to the kitchens and bathrooms and some interior connections, but minor connections. Anyways, this is the main street, main drag of Mexico City. Used to be beautiful, now it has 50 story buildings alongside it, it's a little funky. And this is a, a boulevard uh, created by Mussolini connecting um, St. Peter's to the Tiber. So this is facing the Tiber, it's called uh, Via della uh, Concilia Conciliazione. And it is actually, it, it's actually um, uh, trapezoidal in shape. And uh, so it looks like the city is closer. But when you're looking at, at St. Peter's, it's further or vice versa, I don't remember. But the point is, that it, it it was a it was full of buildings historically, and he opened it up. That was a, a big deal there. Another really important um, project was New Delhi. Uh, who among you have been to New Delhi? I would expect a, you know more of you than from the American side of the universe. And um, this was by Lutyens, um, uh, his plan for New Delhi. What's really interesting here is that you have the diagonals without the grid, kind of. You have some places with a grid. It looks like he's trying to do so many geometric games, and he was very good at this. Like you have this square thing or this rectangular, just off square thing shape, and you, but this is where your axis is going, the main axis of the thing. This is the um, president's house uh, in India, formerly the viceroy's. And these are the buildings that, that were built by uh, uh, Baker and Lutyens. Lutyens designed the president's house. It's huge. It's like a 100,000 square foot house. And the viceroy's, the first night they, went, they, they moved in, um, the family, they, they were just lost. When they left two years later, they said that it was the most intimate house they had ever lived in. Lutyens was good. He was really, 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 really good. 
And as you get closer, um, you kind of see that you're not seeing the bottom of this. And the reason for that is that halfway up the hill, <laughs> Baker put a bump <laughs> and, and Lechens wanted to kill him. But it, he, you know, he was going back and forth, India, India to London. And when he came back, he found this bump in the street and he's like, what was he thinking? Anyways, even the best make mistakes. You can see that uh, that bump over here where you have the ramp and then the bump. Uh, this is the parliament. Um, this was built in 1927. And obviously it has all these good stories to go with it. So uh, right now, um, people in, in, in Delhi, they're asked when this was built. They think it was built in Mughal times or pre-Mughal times. Anyways, that's how we build like Hausman. Um, this this is in, on, in, on the, in the Capitol Hill neighborhood in Washington, D.C. Behind, I think this is the I think this is the the back side of the Supreme Court building. So we're we're starting to get to the uh, um, the finale here. I think um, we're um, we understand more questions. What would you do with a city like Brisbane? Yeah, I think um, Ms. Lyons has answers. <laughs> I was, I was going to say the um, Anacostia River plan is a great uh, template for the Brisbane River. It floods um, fairly regularly. Um, we don't have enough um, green riverside space, um, not enough bridges, um, all the things, same, same sort of situation. Um, we have so. to relearn how to do urban rivers. Mm. It's an art. So we're looking at multiple um, multiple uh, knowledge bases actually that work together as you can see from this list. And the values that, that are unique to the CPI and what we do is that architecture is central to urbanism. We're genuinely holistic. We're all about balancing town and country and the crafts are essential. And what we propose, what we teach and what we practice is not problem solving, but long-term aspirational planning. The long-term is so that you will be validated by a built environment, permanent, if you want to call it, uh, in the eyes of your great-grandchildren. And it's a holistic approach. It's got three, three phases to the process, the aspiration part, the holistic frameworks, and the authenticity. And an example of how we did this aspiration part um, we, we did it uh, recently in Jerusalem. We're working on, on a long-term plan for there. Um, what do you love about Jerusalem? What do you want more of? And what do you want that you don't have now? That's what I would ask the people of Brisbane. What do you love about Brisbane? What do you want more of? And what do you want that you don't have now? And you'll be surprised. When people talk about bad stuff, they talk a lot. We talk a lot about bad stuff. A lot less about good stuff. Ask people, what do they really love and what they want? The list is gonna be mighty short. And, and this is a city that's been in that location for about 3000 years. And um, people have a pretty good idea about and so on and so forth. So we, we got together a bunch of, of, actually they were mostly professionals, architects, because they would be even more opinionated than the average bear. And we got from them, um, uh, stuff like with a, regard to natural things, to the urban um, issues, people, spiritual buildings and parks, what they want to see more of in, in, in Jerusalem wasn't that much. And the great thing is that that immediately converted to urban design guidelines that are about reconnecting with the landscape connecting with the townscape. I'm not showing you the detail stuff. You can, you can read that or well, whatever. We'll get it to you some other way. But um, you see here how the aspiration immediately translates to urban design guidelines and not problem solving dicta. 
and, and it's, it's really comprehensive. You can see how this can key into diversity and equity and, 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 and asset allocation and everything else that you want these days in the world. Dr. Burris, yes, ma'am. Would it be possible to show us some of the uh, visuals from Jerusalem, like the the building designs, so that people can see? Designs, yeah, yeah. Um, let's. Um, so, for let's those who don't find... know, that research was from a um, community engagement process to create a hundred year plan for Jerusalem. So, a classic plan for an existing city. Uh, to address, you know, some of the problems we talked about at the beginning and are so familiar with, like urban sprawl and the problem of freeways. And I, I, I have never come across an, another framework that uh, tries to seriously address those uh, challenges for, for big cities. So this is a really meaningful um, methodology. I actually, um, I actually presented today in, in, in Israel, this thing. Um, where are we, Jerusalem deck? I am showing you, you saw a lot of this stuff already. Um, and then we go into the Jerusalem part of it. Um, really, the, um, the the way this works, <clears throat> first of all, this is a process that is in development. I, I was supposed to meet with Mike Day, and we just missed each other until it, 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 we missed each other. But I was really um, looking to work with him to translate some of this terminology into latter day planning jargon so that we can better communicate it to professionals. Question number one was, where do we start? And the answer is, you don't use bad urban fabric over the long term. It's either going to collapse on its own or you take it down because it's cruddy. And then you ask, well, what was the last moment of urban homeostasis? That's what you look for. And in the case of Jerusalem, in the case of Jerusalem, there was a 1922 map developed for it. The old city of Jerusalem is this little square here. And you can see very little stuff outside it. And this guy, a uh, McLean, um, who, uh, uh, from the British mandate, McLean and Ashby, uh, produced this plan. This map is from 1937, which we kind of say 1940 was the last moment of urban homeostasis there. Um, and and uh, we're going to overlay the two of them in a moment. But until then, you see the pattern over here where he tried, here's the old city, and he tried to create an axis that goes to the Jaffa Gate, the most important gate in the city, has two most important gates. One is, the, you see these two, this V coming here, that is the, the Damascus Gate, and then you have the Jaffa Gate. They're the most important, then you have other gates, I think 11 or 13 gates. So here is Saarinen's plan for a neighborhood in Helsinki, and all of you know Saarinen's plan for Canberra. And they, they occurred about the same time. Um, so you see here this kind of wanting to be both radial and axial and gritty so that you can actually get good. Um, the grid actually is the most efficient way to lay out any urban environment. And by the way, in Manhattan, it's not the terminated vistas that are, that are missing so much in my humble opinion. Although, yeah, sure, let's have some more terminated vistas. What I love about Manhattan is that every block is different. They're all identical in geometry and every block feels different. It has different character. So the neighborhood character trumps, uh, trumps uh, um, uh, whatchamacallit, um, edge, blah, blah, blah. Um, so you see here that initially there were very, very few buildings outside the walls of, of the old city. And that then we're overlaying this. 
and that by 1937, you had a lot of development here, both Arab and Jewish, about 50-50. And when you look into it, this is the area where, where he put his big diagonal. It's actually kind of empty. So he was looking at opportunities in the fabric where to put his stuff, McLean. And also, he you, you see here this, this fantastic mixing of grids and bending of grids. He took that from the, the Canberra plant straight ahead. Yeah. Um, then we looked at um, the holistic armatures coming from the standpoint, no two places are the same. And we did these. I think that they are holistic analyses where in, if you're dealing in holism, it's never a, a, just an analysis. It, it also has some kind of cues or, 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 or clues. Oh, cue and clue, huh? Look at that, just an L missing. I should be on Jeopardy. Um, it it had, gives you clues to what to do. And in this case, you have here two very, very different ecosystems, the deserts and the Mediterranean separated by a watershed, the watershed line. And in that you have literally islands in the landscape because it's very hilly and people built on top of the islands and left the, the wadis basically for flooding. And then that's where they put a lot of the streets. But the, 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 you call this an urban plan? Where's the order? How would you ever know what's important and what's not? Where are you? How can you tell if you are over here or over here? And all of it done out of respect for topography. In other words, having the streets follow the contour lines. Saarinen also came up with another map that we're going to see in a moment. This is what we call the Noli Saarinen map, where he, uh, he had a similar condition with sort of, this is Helsinki, be, there are places with water like here and here, um, and then large meadow areas or what have you. And then you had these sort of neighborhoods separated by countryside, a beautiful balance of urban space. Um, this is kind of the model of what good urban space might look like, but you can still see that this is the most important part and this is very important over here and so on and so forth. In our naivete, we thought that the street system actually did have a grid of streets going through it, at least at a big level, you know, at the at the 500 meter level or something, at the kilometer level. This is a city of a million people. Um, and that we could actually identify the gates and paths of Jerusalem. But what we discovered was that all the roads were built since 1922 prioritized cars and they were horrible to be in. So then we went back and through the Noli idea, the Saarinen idea on the map. And, and um, the, Noli, the Noli map is a unique map uh, designed by Gian Battista Noli, drawn by Gian Battista Noli in the 1750s of Rome. And you see here in the middle of the map is the Pantheon and it's surrounded by urban fabric that is inaccessible what is accessible is anything that was open 24 seven. So you could, all the churches were open 24 seven. You had some gardens that were open. You had some courtyards surrounded by buildings that were accessible 24 seven. So that's how he created his map. We, we um, uh, describe it as um, accessible, inaccessible in terms of, um, it's not public private. That's not a good enough distinction, but it is it is kind of closer. Um, but we're looking at a very large scale. So when you drill into the scale, you also find places where you have natural spots for plazas to occur. And when you're maturing urban fabric, you need those plazas, those important subspaces to occur because the single most important space obviously is Dome of the Rock in the old city. And then you have here all this area here that is the, the, the Jewish um, government and university and museum park 
Um, I'm, I'm not sure where the, 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 the Palestinian right now is in Ramallah, but Leon Creer wants to, wants to draw a, um, a, uh, a capital for the Palestinians. And all this is about reconstituting the urban rhythm that comes from the rhythm of the hills that, that you're walking around, as well as uh, to a certain degree, the rhythm of the hills also shows up in the rhythm of parks. Uh, I'm not gonna go into how we locate parks based on foraging patterns, um, but you see here new parks and old parks. The slopes are obviously important. So we're learning from the slopes that you need an architecture for the top and an architecture for, for the slope, the, uh, the steeper slope. And they're very, very different types of urban fabric. And, and that, that's like a really important lesson. There's a whole business of view sheds there coming from the biblical notion that the city is surrounded by mountains. So we drew the, we drew the God blessed mountains that surround the city. And there are these yellow things. The, the, the city basin is about at 700 meters. These hills are at 800 meters. So they're, they're noticeably, notably taller and you have views from them. And this is the view shed within which you should not have, you should not see the roof of a single tall building. And then you, you put the map together, you get a composite map, which starts indicating, it's not so much this is what you're going to do, this, it's more, this is where you need to think about what you wanna do. And this, this would then be converted, developed into very specific local plans. So you don't, so far we haven't written a single piece of paper code. This basically is the code. In other words, you, you have your, your um, deserts, uh, your desert landscape, you have your Mediterranean landscape, the countrysides, you have your old parks and new parks, you have these, these um, sort of roads that maybe these roads would ac actually work for, um, maybe these roads would work for, uh, for, for uh, a light rail or, or maybe they would have underneath them uh, subways and so on and so forth. And when you look at the comparable city densities, Jerusalem is the red line, Manhattan is, is the is Manhattan. The blue thing is Rome within the walls. It's about 350,000 people, I think, 375. And here's Paris, 2 million people. Jerusalem has a million people. You can, in, in what is Jerusalem, you can probably fit in 3 million people. And, and they're, they're having a cow trying to fit another 20,000 folks into, into Jerusalem. In fact, it has no problems. All it needs is to do the right thing. And the way you do it is through the community aspiration, which I just showed you. Okay. And the most important part of it is this, where you actually have authentic Brisbane fabric, which would be composed of the distribution of building styles that make up Brisbane or that neighborhood in Brisbane. And then of course, because you're a classic planner, you can elevate it. You can make some things prettier. You can make some things taller to get the density, maintaining the style or doing it in the prettier style, or maybe even introducing a new style that, that complements everything would be considered the next step up, so to speak. So we have this authenticity. These are the actual tools we use, triage, villagization, densification. They kind of speak for themselves, I think at this point. And then leveraging authenticity and beauty to mature urban fabric, which I just mentioned, and growing while regaining Jerusalem, Perth, what have you. So the way we, we do this, this thing with the, we triage and we amplify the neighborhood identity and, and attain densification through just a few stories of, of added construction. And that's where you do it. You, you, you make sure that these locations are really, really pretty. And right now we are working on this intersection here, which <laughs> happens to not have a, a uh, it's funny. Um, I, 
the guy who drew this map is in Jerusalem and he knows the city very, very well. And he didn't put anything over here. However, this is the, it's actually called Paris Square, apropos, right? And it is the place where all of the, or many of the demonstrations happen. It's a very small space, but a lot of demonstrations. And this is how we were thinking for Jerusalem to get the authenticity, because we need something that's dense. And you can see that all this comes off the Rue de Rivoli. In fact, it comes off the Rue de Rivoli via Marseille. And these are all buildings in Algiers, on the Algiers waterfront. But they're big. They're pretty. You can add a floor and you'll still get a pretty good looking building. Look how tall the ceilings are. That's for the Mediterranean climate. They have great ventilation uh, you, uh, with the big doors and everything else. And shade and shadow also with the thick walls and the, and the shutters. So we started drawing these as a template for buildings of that size that we might want to have in Jerusalem. And then, um, thinking about how to articulate them because you still want something that is reasonably Middle Eastern. So these are all buildings from Beirut, I think mostly. It's got some really, really pretty stuff going on there also. The more, the, 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 the whole Middle East or all of Asia is very, very different. Really every hundred kilometers, it's like completely different kind of a thing. Uh, so what, what works in Beirut uh, it's a little different in Damascus, a little different in Jerusalem, a little different in Gaza, a little different in Cairo, very different in Cairo. Um, and we're, we're developing three projects which are going to go here when we have them. Um, and uh, this is uh, our thank you from the Jerusalem YMCA, which is one of the prettiest buildings. It's the best, one of the best, one of the two good, three good buildings in Israel, Dome of the Rock, YMCA, and Rockefeller Museum. You'll notice here that each one of these uh, is has a different biblical plant. And on the other side, this is on the north side of the building, North Arcade, South Arcade is biblical animals. This building was built by Frank Harmon in the same year that he built the Empire State Building. So Harmon himself was Bozar educated. This is how you do it. Thank you very, very much. Can we have pretty stuff now, please? Well, I love this because it's, um, you know, the Mediterranean climate of Israel is, a, is, a, is similar to some of the climates we have here in Australia. And what strikes me just listening to you, Dr. Burris, is how, uh, how far we've strayed in mainstream planning from very common sense ideas. Uh, all of the stuff you've been talking about today is exactly how we should be thinking about our cities, um, you know, at a government level, but we've mostly abandoned this approach, which is actually unbelievable when you think about it. Um, and the architecture really as well, the, the, the genius loci, the authenticity and spirit of a place that comes out in the universal classical language is, um, you know, really moving and I can imagine different you know applications for Australia um we may not have biblical plants but there are lots of local indigenous motifs plants yeah, and we could integrate stuff. you know so thank you well you don't you. need biblical plants you have all your stuff as a matter of fact Israel is full yeah. of eucalyptus yeah there has always been a very a very strong bond i always thought between australians and israelis somehow or other i think partially because the soldiers who came with allenby to true somewhere australian mm, probably true and i think we're just no bullshit kind of people yeah yeah <laughs> so that's great look um you know I, you I do much. have to do a plug i'm sorry we went a bit over uh, for the Classic Planning Academy. So if you're interested in learning more about these techniques and applications and actually testing them out, uh, you know, in your own project, studio project, the next intake of the Classic Planning Academy is open now. Um, and there's an opportunity to study if you're based in Europe and America, but we're also uh, 
We're also trying out a Asia and Australia time zone. So please do check that out if you're interested. But um, other than that, thank you, Nishara, and thank you, Dr. Burris. Thank you all very much. And Mike, I hope to uh, reconnect with you soon. <laughs> it's been an honor to um, speak here. And, I, and I, I wish I knew the people a little bit so I'd know who I'm speaking to. It might have been a better show. Um, so come next time. Thank you Alrighty. so, so much. Okay, take care. You too. Bye now. Thank you. Bye.